So sit, so sit just come out tonight. I am going to preach on the everlasting covenant. I, I am glad that Sunday, yesterday, and even in some spots today, we've had some of the guys who, who made reference to the everlasting covenant. And I'm glad they did because it, it gives verification and validity to what uh, I, I'm going to be preaching tonight. And the reason I wanted to preach this, I've had it on the schedule for a long time on the conference website, is because uh, we have theologians who discuss and write books about uh, when redemptive history began. And you've got some who will say that a redemptive history begins with the Abraham covenant when God came to, to Abraham and made the covenant with him. You've got others who say that a redemptive history began in Genesis when uh, God dealt with Adam and Eve and their sin. And you have others who speculate that redemptive history uh, began at various times. And I believe that the biblical way to look at the situation about when redemptive history began is to look beyond history and look into the distant past before there was a human history. Because really, scripturally, redemptive history began before there was any man. It began before any man was created. It began before Jesus came and, and died upon the cross. Redemptive history began before time even existed or before the earth was formed by the word of God. Redemptive history began in eternity past and redemptive history was conceived, it was planned, and it was carried out by the Godhead. And, and there's some significant things about redemptive history that I want to talk about tonight. Number one, redemptive history is different and, and the everlasting covenant is different from any other covenant that God has made with man. God's made the, the, the there's a lot of theologians who, who, who believe that God has made the, the Adamic co covenant with with Adam and with Eve, primarily with Adam. There are those who also believe, and I think most theologians would believe that there's the Noahic covenant which God made with Noah after the flood. There was, of course, the Abrahamic covenant which God made with, with Abraham. And then there's the Mosaic covenant which God made with, with Moses. And then we have the Davidic covenant, which God made with David. And I, I have some books at home that I've studied the last few years about covenants. And there's a lot of disagreement about particular covenantal uh, theological ideas. We're not going to get into that tonight. And, and the reason we're not is when we begin to plan the conference, we decide that we're going to, to preach primarily upon evangelism and the salvation of souls and soteriality. So we're not really, any, none of the titles have anything to do with any deep discussion into those areas 
where we may disagree on the law or the covenants, and I'm certainly not going to preach anything about eschatology because there would be massive differences in our interpretation of that. But in order to concentrate tonight, and in order to zero in on, on evangelism and biblical evangelism, and to keep true to the conference theme of the covenant of the, the doctrines of grace and biblical evangelism, the theology of biblical evangelism, the methodology of biblical evangelism. I want us to go back to the very beginning. Brother Earl this morning got close to the very beginning. He talked about total depravity. And he talked about the sin of Adam and, and all the effect of Adam's sin. But to really understand why we Calvinists believe like we believe, we have to go back beyond even that. We have to go back to the annals of time before there was any earth time whatsoever, back to the time when our mind's imagination, we can imagine that the Godhead existed alone by themselves. None of us has been there. We don't know how they existed. We don't know what the, the, the environment was like. We don't know whether they were living in pitch black darkness. We don't know what they were doing. But we know they were in existence because they are infinite and they are in, eternal. They're without beginning and without end. God told Moses, I am. I am what I am. And so the scripture gives us some hints about what happened before time began concerning the everlasting covenant. I want us to read tonight in the book of John, the sixth chapter, if you'll turn there, the sixth chapter of John. And some of the verses I will read are, have already been read probably today. But I will look at the 6th chapter of John and begin with verse 36. And we're going to begin to see a glimpse of what the everlasting covenant is all about. It says in verse 36, But I say unto you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe me. Now here's the key. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will in no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. And then the verse that we talked about today, verse 6, chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. There is a discussion there of salvation, of soteriology. And that's why this is one reason we call ourselves reformed. This is one reason, these verses, why we call ourselves Calvinists. This is one reason in these verses why we preach the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to look tonight, and I want us to examine the fact that all other theological systems, including uh, uh, Arminianism, and including the other isms and all the isms out there, 
As I said earlier today, do not have the doctrines in our theology that makes our theology biblical theology. If, if a theology does not have predestination in it, it's not biblical theology. And do I say that because I'm a Calvinist? Not entirely. I say that because predestination, and we will read in just a moment, is found in the scriptures, and it's clearly taught in the scriptures, and if you don't teach and preach that doctrine, then you're not preaching biblical theology. You can't skirt over it. And there's probably thousands upon thousands of preachers who will never ever preach on that subject because they either don't understand it, they are afraid of it, or they're afraid they will offend someone. Now, 30 years I was Armenian. In 30 years I preached a gospel that I thought was the correct, true gospel. And when God opened my eyes to reading Arthur Pink's Sovereignty of God, and, and he, 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 he gave me these spiritual eyes to see these doctrines, it changed my whole life. And I began to see doctrines that I had never seen before. And that was one of them. There are other truths that are in our theology which are not found in other theologies. And if you don't go back to the beginning with God, and if you don't read these verses in John and, and really claim them and really preach them and understand what they're saying, you will have an erroneous theology and you will have an erroneous, ineffective evangelism. Because you will look at the world in a completely different way. But talking tonight as we do of, of the covenant, the everlasting covenant, I, I know there are theologians down through history who have written books, great volumes, I can name the names, but I don't have time. And, and there's always been a controversy over the covenants, especially in later years, which we won't get into. But there are different names for the everlasting covenant. Uh, I, I think the most common name is the, the covenant of redemption. And, and the covenant of redemption explained by many theologians is interpreted as the same theology as what we call the everlasting covenant. It's simply called by a different name. I begin to study what some men have written about the, written about the, the uh, doctrines there are associated with the covenant of grace and their various interpretations of what the covenant of grace means to them. And, and to my surprise, I myself have found few references to the covenant of grace as being the same as the everlasting covenant. I think most of the guys have called it the covenant of redemption. And yet, Spurgeon called it something else. And it's been very dear to my heart. I, I have a lot of things happen in my office. I, had, I stumbled across uh, Ramzan's card there that I told you that today. And years ago, I stumbled across a, a magazine that had been written years earlier by people who were reprinting Spurgeon's sermons. And in this magazine, as I looked at it, it had in bold letters across the top page, the everlasting covenant. And since that time, 
Since that time and since I read that title, I have fallen in love with those words, the everlasting covenant. That's what Spurgeon called it. I, I've read other guys who call it the same time, the same thing. And, and there are very good reasons that Spurgeon called it that because that's exactly what it is. And we're going to examine that tonight. In the beginning of time, before time, I don't think there's anyone who can deny that the Godhead created a plan. And the plan has been called the plan of salvation. Now, now this particular plan of salvation is quite different from other plans of salvation. For you see, other plans of salvation will tell you that in order to be saved, you are required to help God save you. Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, Arminianism, whatever you want to, want to look at. But their plan of salvation is that God sent Jesus and Jesus died for you on the cross. And Jesus wants to save you. I listened to preaching last like this all the time I was growing up as a young man in South Carolina. And they would preach and they would say, oh, Jesus wants to, to come into your heart, as Brother Earl said this morning, and Jesus wants to save you. And the Holy Spirit is, is calling out to you and He's pleading with you and he's, he's begging you to be saved. And then, of course, as you all know, you, you can magically become saved by raising your hand. We went to the airport the other day to pick up my brother Earl. And let me say this quick because he's not in here yet. We got to the airport and Highway, who was a, a real comedian sometimes, we drove in there and Brother Earl was up in front of us and there was traffic everywhere. And as we approached Brother Earl, he stood there and started raising his hand and waving at us so we recognized who he was. So Smarley the Cowie says, I thought you said the guy was a cabinet. He's an Armenian. He's back there raising his hand. Get his hand in there. <laughs> and so, oh, that's not him. That's Jeff. Thank goodness. <laughs> but, but that was a funny little thing. But really, they, they would say, say such things as, the Holy Spirit wants to come into your heart. Please let him in. Please let him save you. And, and, and the implication there, and what was really being said, and I didn't see it at the time, but I see it clearly now, is that the Holy Spirit, which their view of is, that he is too weak to do his job. He's too weak to save you. He's too weak to, by himself, work salvation in you. He just wants to do it, but he's, he's weak. And, and he can't do it. That's what they're saying. And Jesus died on the cross. And he rose from the dead. And he died for your sins. And, and yet, he can't save you either because they've got that picture of him standing outside of a door knocking on the door, begging to come in. Beloved, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, does not beg anyone to come in. What He does, He will irresistibly, through the Holy Spirit, figuratively speaking, knock the door down and come in when He's ready to come in. It's an entirely disparate gospel. You cannot have a part in your salvation. And there's no preacher who can pronounce you to be saved. And so, what causes all these different interpretations and methodologies of evangelism? It's one thing, and one thing only. 
That's why we're having this conference. What causes the differences in the Reformed Biblical Evangelism and an evangelism which does not see God as God and will not allow God to completely save sinners but will call sinners to believe that they have to have a part in their salvation. They will call sinners to believe that they have to determine the time and the place of their salvation, which is doing this certain thing. It is stripping the Holy Spirit of His authority and His power to save you when God says it's time to be saved. If you tell a man that he can be saved anytime he wants to be saved, beloved, you're not telling that man the truth. He cannot be saved when he wants to be saved. He's not going to want to be saved anytime he wants to be saved. He is not able to be saved anytime he wants to be saved. And the reason is, the sinner is dead in sin and he can do none of these things. He will be saved when the sovereign God of heaven decides that it's time for him to be saved. Spurgeon preached some strong sermons in this vein and calls me to be a little more bold. God will go When he's ready to save a sinner, he will send the Holy Spirit to find that sinner and he will search for that sinner. He, will, he knows where he is. He'll search him out. He goes to him and he intersects his life as he did the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul wasn't thinking about being saved. Paul wasn't wanting to be saved. Paul was going to persecute Christians. And all of a sudden, God struck him down with his mighty hand and he placed him on the ground in the dirt. And Paul never knew what hit him. As a matter of fact, he woke up and looked around and he couldn't see. He was blinded. God initiated Paul's salvation. God planned Paul's salvation. And God knew before the foundation of the world because of the everlasting covenant when the Apostle Paul would be saved. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is 100% of the Lord with no trace of any man's hands upon his own salvation. It's all of God. And how do we know that? I want to read another verse to you in the book of Romans. Would you turn to the 8th chapter of Romans? I'm going to read verses which are sharing with us what the everlasting covenant is all about. In the 8th chapter of Romans. We begin in verse 29. Well, we better begin in 28. 8.28 And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. We'll stop there. Those who are called, called. Do you know one other thing our theology has that other theologies do not have? Our theology, our Calvinist theology, has the doctrine of the effectual call. You remember all those preachers I told you in Greenville, South Carolina? They would beg the sinners to come. The Holy Spirit wants you to come. But oh, he's so pitiful and he's so weak, he, he can't make you come. And oh, the Holy Spirit is very polite. He will never influence you or force you to come to Jesus. That's one of what the Bible says. Paul says here, 
Because those who are the call according to his purpose. The Holy Spirit is not calling and begging, but the Holy Spirit is effectually calling sinners to salvation. And God sees that it's time for them to be saved. That's one of the greatest doctrines I've ever learned. I was 30 years, well, not 30 years, but until I was 30 something years old, a Southern Baptist evangelist running around saving everything that moved. And I really thought that I had to do it myself. I would look out at those people and I would preach to them and, and I would say, I've got to think of something tonight to say that will make them come and, and make them be saved. Because, beloved, I did not understand the effectual call. But when I came to understand the effectual call, I realized it was not me that brought them to be saved. Only the Father can draw them, verse 44 tells us here. And I realized it was my job to preach the gospel, to witness to them, to live before them, to do everything in my power as a means of God's grace to have a small part in presenting the gospel to them. And then I realized that it was God who actually is going to do the same. I began to realize that I can witness to a person about Jesus and walk away not feeling guilty because I failed, because I did not save them. Because I realized I can walk away and leave them in the hands of the Holy Spirit of God who was the only one who could save them. He goes on to say, verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and he would call, these he also justified. A lot of the Gospels are different this verse. And whom he justifies, them he also glorifies. Now, if this be true, and if God's plan of salvation is not a shallow, manipulative gospel that tries to influence and make people come to Him in the flesh, then what's the difference? The difference is that one is the gospel and one is not. I'm sure that's not a very popular thing to say. Either God saves sinners or men save sinners. It can't be both ways. Another thing that the other systems of theology and evangelism do not have is the doctrine of the everlasting covenant. I, I'm not going to call it the covenant of redemption because I've fallen in love with Spurgeon's name, the everlasting covenant. And we've heard about it already. But, you know, if, if God created a plan, He's a perfect God. And I cannot conceive in my mind that God would create a plan of salvation if he did not sit down with the other members of the Godhead and somehow come to an agreement about how that would work. Spurgeon, I, I started to bring Spurgeon's book, but I, I, I'm too weak to. Tom Meadows just wrote a book on Spurgeon. It's about this thick, this wide, and weighs about 20 pounds. And I didn't think I could get it up here. But it's got some, a whole section I read this week on Spurgeon's Everlasting Covenant. Beautiful, beautiful book. You guys all about that. But it says here in, in, in the book of Romans that it was predestined. That means that God created and decided to do this before the foundation of the world.
And others have said this this week, that before time began, this is what Spurgeon said, he used to talk about it in his own language, in his own imagination. I think Spurgeon probably had the greatest imagination of any preacher who's possibly lived. He could dream up things, and he would, he, would, he would talk to his people, and he would say, I can just imagine, of course he doesn't know, but he would speculate, and he said, I, I, I can just imagine that, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit would sit down in heaven, and the Father would say, we're going to create creatures, and we're going to create a world. And he said, these creatures are going to need a Savior because they're going to fall into sin. And then they're going to begin to talk. And you can get into superlapsarianism, sublapsarianism, and uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg, and, and, and uh, did God choose before Adam fell, or did God wait until, in his mind's eye, in his mind's eye, did he wait in his mind's eye to, to Adam fell, and, 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 and then he decided to, to, to say, we won't get into all that tonight. We'll go straight to the point, cut straight to the chase. The final decision was that God would send Jesus to save sinners. And not only that, that God would send Jesus to save the people, as we just read in John, that the Father had given to Jesus. And then the Father might have said, as Spurgeon said, and as, as they talked, who's going, to, who's going to go and save them? Who will go and save these people? And I can imagine that they begin to look logically at the situation and they begin to deduce who it would be that could go and save these sinners. It couldn't be an angel. Because an angel was a created being. And, and no created being could go to earth and save another created being because they would have no authority and they would have no power to do it. It could not have been a human being. Because no human being has ever lived a perfect life free from sin. They've all been corrupted by Adam's sin as Brother Earl so, so eloquently preached to us this morning. It could be a human being. <coughs> Who's going to go? Who's going to go and save the sinners? Who, who would want to go and do such a thing? And hang on a cross and suffer and die. And then as we imagine, and these are only imaginative conversations. If you can imagine in your mind that God said, well, it has to be a person who is perfect. Free from sin. Who qualifies for that? It has to be a person as the blood sacrifices shed, whose blood is clean and pure and infinite. And I don't know what happened, but as we imagine still, it could have been that. The Father asked one more time, who can we send? And can't you imagine that possibly it may have happened like this? This is certainly not exegesis. This is some real isogesis. But I can imagine, as I think along with Spurgeon, I can imagine Jesus speaking up and saying, Father, I will go. I will go and I will die for the sinners. And not only that, but he said, since they're, they're your people that you've given to me, and you have chosen which ones you want to save, 
and you've assigned them to my account, I will not only go, Father, but I will go and I will die for the ones you've given to me. They're mine to die for. Then I can imagine Jesus saying, not only that, But I will go and die for the sheep that you've given to me. I will go and die for the elect that you've given to me. And then he might have said something like this. In this everlasting covenant that we're about to make, I will covenant that I will go and I will die for my bride. Isn't that beautiful? My bride. His bride, it wasn't the Father's bride, it wasn't the Holy Spirit's bride, but the bride was the bride of Jesus. And that's you and I. That's the church. How, how, how beautiful it is that, that the Godhead would speak of the ones that Jesus would die for as his bride. God knows there's nothing no special more special than a man's bride with the bride of Christ. And so the agreement was made. And if you read good theology, another thing we have that other systems of theology do not have, we have a theology of salvation and evangelism, which includes and makes necessary the three persons of the Godhead. Some systems emphasize, such as the Charismatics, they emphasize the Holy Spirit. It's kind of, as we say in South Carolina, it's kind of out of whack. Some place a great emphasis upon Jesus, which is rightly so. So do we. Some place a great emphasis upon the Father, and that also is rightly so. But good solid theology, biblical theology, places the emphasis of soteriology, of salvation, and of evangelism on all three members of the Godhead. It's the only system that makes a clear, distinct, logical, scriptural progression from beginning to end. It goes like this in the book of John, the sixth chapter we just read. The Father's responsibility that he gladly accepted and he made of himself is that he will give the ones to be saved to the Son. And the Son's responsibility is to take the ones that God the Father gave to him as he clearly teaches and the Son will go, and He will substitute Himself vicariously in a substitutionary atonement for the ones that He's died, that the Father's given to Him. Them and no one else. Only the elect. Only the sheep. Only the church. Only His bride. And Jesus will go and he will die for those the Father has given to him. And he will shed his blood. And he will be beaten. And he will die a death on the cross. And he will be raised from the dead to save him. And then the Holy Spirit's responsibility in salvation. The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to take the Lord that the Father has given to the Son to take the ones that the Son has gone to the cross and died for, those and only them. And the Holy Spirit will come to the sinners that Jesus has died for, and He will bring them lovingly to salvation. And salvation will be totally of God and the Godhead. Without any man 
having anything to do with it. Not one thing. That separates us from all the other theologies. Amen. And it's a beautiful thing. Oh, beloved, listen to me. You ask, you ask Jeff and you, and you ask Chris and Dave and Si and those that go out in the streets and Kirk and, and all the others of you guys, Randy and Bob, all you guys. I can't mention everybody I'm running out of breath. But uh, all you street preachers out there, when you go out there and people curse you and spit at you and call you all manner of names, you don't really worry too much because you know that God sent you to find the ones that the Father gave to the Son. And you know that you can't save them. You know that. Other street preachers who believe in another system of theology, they don't know that. And they'll put cardboard signs on themselves and, and act ridiculous in order to draw attention to themselves and try to save people themselves. But you know, you know that you cannot save them. But you know you must preach to them. You know you must love them. You know you must seek them out. And you know that you have got to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've got to preach Jesus to them. You can do nothing else. You can't help it. God won't let you help it. God won't let you rest. He will make you to preach the gospel to them. But you know what you do that the other preachers don't do? After you preach the gospel, you can witness to them. You can talk to them. You can even pray with them. But you cannot save them. That's led to the Holy Spirit. And listen, the one thing that really torments me and, and hurts me is there's so many preachers around this world in their warped evangelism, which is a because they're not God-centered and they're man-centered, they tell people they're saved all the time when they don't know whether they're saved or not. They take the Holy Spirit's job away from Him and they try to perform it themselves. I will not tell a sinner after I've witnessed to Him. I don't care how much He cries. I will not tell a sinner that I know that He is now saved because that would be a lie. I do not know. It's a subjective, inward experience. And you can't go around telling people they're saved. You preach to them, you witness to them, and pray with them, and you live their salvation to God. I'll tell you about my uncle Avery. We've got to close. We've got a good preacher about to come up here. But I'm better looking than him. <laughs> That's a real joke. <laughs> he, he looks like a movie star, man. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to tell you about my uncle. I think he can whip me. I don't want to get, go make him too mad. <laughs> Let me tell you about my uncle Avery and his biblical conversion. My uncle Bert Avery, well actually, my uncle Avery was a lot like Jeff. He, he, was, a, he was a pretty tough guy. And uh, when he grew up, uh, he had an accident and one of his eyes was put out. But he was strong, he was strong, he was stocky, and he and my dad and the seven of the brothers and I'm closing with this. Grew up in a place called the Ape Yard. Because it was filled with apes and stupid guys and drunks and all, all manner of evil. And every day, that place was so bad, it's kind of like Camden, they had to fight their way to school and fight their way home. It was a rough place. And they grew up tough and hard. And they grew up without Jesus. Now my grandmother, Lucy, their mother, 
was a Christian. She prayed for those boys every day of her life. And my Uncle Avery was probably the worst one. I, I don't think he ever lost a fight in his life. And he probably had at least two fights every day. He was tough. And he was mean. And I remember that my dad finally got saved. You know, I got to tell you this. My dad, I really believe, was saved. The first sermon I ever preached. That was one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life. I watched him be lost all those years. I watched him drink all those years and, and all the chaos and all the stuff that went on. And, and then the night I preached, uh, I, I really believe that God touched him. Because from that day forward, he changed. He was different. His nature changed. You know what our evangelism and our theology has that other systems of theology do not have? We have the doctrine, if you can call it a doctrine, of the change of nature. They say make a decision. They say simply believe. There's a lot more to believe than just believe. The devil believes, beloved. The devil believes that Jesus is the Christ. Salvation and evangelism is not intellectual assent. You have to have a supernatural act of God, as Arthur Pink said, in order to be saved. You have to have a change of nature in order to be saved. Well, very quickly, let me go. My uncle Abraham, they used to, he and my dad used to bring cars back from New Jersey. Sorry, uh, around New York. South Carolina fixed them up itself. Well, my dad had already been saved, and we'd been praying for my Uncle Avery for years and years and years. And one day, they were coming back from New Jersey to South Carolina. My dad was in the, I think it was the, the car behind, they would, they would have a hookup, they'd take two bars and hook one car to another car and pull it behind them to get it home. And my Uncle Avery was in one car pulling, and my dad was in another car pulling. And all of a sudden, my dad saw my Uncle Avery pull off the road. And when he did, he thought something was wrong. He thought he was sick, and he thought something had happened to him. So my dad pulled off the road and ran up to the car and said, Avery, what's wrong? And my uncle Abe, to me, Superman, to me, the toughest guy in the world, was sitting in the car, crying like a baby, uncontrollably weeping and crying. And I don't think he'd ever cried a tear in his life. He was just too mean. My dad sensed what was wrong. And he said, what's wrong, Avery, what's wrong? And he said, I, I, can't, I can't win, crying uncontrollably. And my dad said, you, you can't win what? He said, I, I can't beat him. I, I can't whip him. I, I can't beat him up. And my dad said, Avery, you're talking incoherently. What are you talking about? He said, I'm, I'm losing the only first fight I've ever lost in my life and I can't do a thing about it. My dad said, what do you mean? He said, look, Virgil, you don't know this, but I've been having a fight with God for months. I have whipped every man I've ever fought. I've whipped three men at a time, but I cannot win this fight. I, I, can't, I can't fight him anymore. I'm giving up. I'm giving up. And I'm giving in. And I'm telling him that he's beaten. Now you wouldn't say that in an evangelist book. But he's a lost sinner. 
He didn't know what theological words to use. But you know, there's a real good principle there. Because he said, I'm giving up to God. He knew what the fight was about. He knew he didn't want to give up his sin. But he also knew he didn't want to go to hell. And yet, he finally said, I'm giving up to God. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to give my, my heart to Jesus. And then my dad started crying. There's two grown men on the side of the road in New Jersey crying their eyes out. And you know what? God did save my uncle Avery because his nature changed and his behavior changed and everything about him changed. And you know one reason why that happened as I close? One reason of many that caused that to happen was the everlasting covenant. Because sometimes in eternity, long before the earth was ever created, God sat down with the Son and the Holy Spirit, and God gave Avery Phillips to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, Son, you go to earth, and you hang on the cross, and you suffer and bleed, and we raise you from the dead, and you die for Avery Phillips. That's why my uncle Avery was saved. And that's why we've got to preach the gospel. Amen. Praise God. Loretta, you want to sing or not? I know I didn't. I forgot. Can you get it together while I bring Jeff? Brother Jeff, would you come up? I think the everlasting covenant is the beginning of redemptive history. Jeff's going to come. He's going to preach for us. Do you have a request? Huh? Do you have a request? Uh, not really. Unless you don't want to do uh, He's Alive, do you? Uh, better not do that. Do another one. Just pick one out. It's okay. Uh, 